Hello everyone, I am uh, George from Ireland. So um, this is a video about Robert Burden Haldane, and here's his London house behind me. Um, anyway, so he was uh, born in, um, uh, there, there it is with the, with the, with the um, uh, brown door, I mean. He was born in um, Edinburgh on Charlotte Square, the same square where um, Douglas uh, Haig, the general, um, was born. So he came from a well-to-do family. They were distinguished doctors and um, uh, Church of Scotland clergymen. So Holden was a very clever lad. He wasn't really into sports. He was corpulent throughout his life. He went to Edinburgh University and uh, where he read philosophy. He spent some time at the University of Göttingen in German, Germany and he became um, absolutely fluent in uh, the German language. He later referred to Germany as a spiritual home. So there were, there were strong um, cultural links between Germany and the United Kingdom at the time. A lot of sympathy between the two. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? They didn't just weren't seem to, seem to, to clash. Um, another thing about Haldane is he was a complete unionist. He definitely believed that Scotland ought to be part of the United Kingdom, a, a view that was scarcely questioned in the late 19th century. Because remember, being born in 1856, he was growing up at really the zenith of unionism. just wasn't questioned. And indeed, he was an imperialist. So um, uh, he had a glittering career at Edinburgh University. And then he decided that he wanted to be called to the Bar of England and Wales. So he came to London, he was called to the Bar, and he started his um, uh, legal career. And he was um, outstanding, particularly in conveyancing. Um, and was mentioned in a number of law reports. So he was making a fortune. He was one of the best paid lawyers in England. Um, uh, so then he was a liberal in politics and he was elected for Haddingtonshire, which is near Edinburgh. Lothian is the county around Edinburgh and they could be divided into Haddingtonshire, Edinburghshire, and I can't remember the other one. But um, we now don't want to say East Lothian, West Lothian, and Mid Lothian. Don't ask me which one Haddingtonshire is. So he represented that constituency on for, for decades, a lot of the decades. He never wed, by the way, though he, he was once affianced. Anyhow, so he rose in liberal ranks. He was good friends with H.H. Uh, H. Asquith, another liberal barrister. Um, and so when the liberals were ushered into the government in 1905, he was appointed to the cabinet, and he was in the cabinet continuously for the next uh, 10 years. So he held various positions, most notably Secretary of State for War, which he held for seven years. I think I'm right in saying he's the longest serving Defence Secretary the United Kingdom has ever had. He used to be called Secretary of State, State for War back then, back then not Secretary uh, of for Defence. And um, he helped organise the Territorial Army as we know it. As we know it, there was a Territorial Force. There was the Yeomanry there separate. As in, these are part-time soldiers who do their ordinary job as a factory worker, a road sweeper, a waiter, a teacher, a pharmacist, whatever your job is. But then one evening a week military training, one week weekend a month military training, two weeks a year military training. And if there is a war, called away from your job to fight. And when the war is over, you're guaranteed your old job back at the same position, at the same salary. A scheme which still goes on to this day. So uh, Hallday never served in the military himself. He was leader of the House of Lords, he was Lord High Chancellor. These days we just had to say Lord Chancellor. So whilst a serving politician, he also practiced at the bar, which was considered entirely acceptable at the time. Another point is um, that members of Parliament were not paid a salary until 1911. So he seen as a moderate within the Liberal Party and believed that um, uh, the uh, Second Boer War was right to fight, but just that the methods used were unacceptable, such as detaining um, Afrikaner civilians, as say those of Dutch stock, and indeed their black employees. Um, in, in these internment camps where some of them died of illnesses. Um, anyway, so uh, Haldane was, was critical in the First World War and some people say his preparation was vital. Uh, he tried to avoid the First World War. He'd met the Kaiser on a number of occasions. Uh, he had many German friends and of course could converse in the Kaiser's native language. Although the Kaiser's English was near perfect. There's actually no need to do so. Could the First World War have been avoided? He tried to. He hosted German professors here. In 1912 there, was, there were talks with Germany about a naval holiday as in both stopping building ships. The Germans will, were willing to, to agree to this contingent on one uh, thing. That was if there was a war which Germany didn't start, the United Kingdom would remain neutral. Um, so uh, but the UK said no to that one. But the Germans say that's unfair, that even if we are attacked, even if we're the victims in this war, you might still join our enemies. Well then, no naval holiday. Although the Anglo-German naval race was largely won by that stage anyway. So the First World War came along and with all his energy and intellect, he threw himself into, into the war effort. But he was out of the cabinet briefly in the middle of that. 
He's the leader of the House of Lords for a while. He was close to Asquith. He was not happy with Lloyd George taking over as Prime Minister. And he'd been a liberal radical, seen as an anti-imperialist. Lloyd George wasn't really an anti-imperialist, not at that stage. Um, but uh, he'd been um, heavily critical of uh, the government's conduct during the South African War of 1899 to 1902. He'd been a hate figure for the Conservatives, who nevertheless forgave him and served under him as Prime Minister in 1916 to 22. Um, so he was a bit out of favour all day because of uh, Lloyd George was Prime Minister. But remember, Asquith remained the leader of the Liberal Party. Two thirds of the Liberal Party sided with Asquith over that one. And Asquith was leader of the Liberal Party until the mid 20s. Um, Anyway, so uh, then the Liberals were eventually out of government. Uh, he was a good friend of the Webbs, helped them set up the London School of Economics. Uh, so he was, he was a noted philosopher, wrote a number of books on it. And indeed, he was offered to be a don at Balliol College, Oxford, one of the most illustrious colleges in Oxford University, but he turned it down. He wanted to carry on practicing. Another thing might have appealed to him is Balliol has strong links with Scotland, as in named in honor of John Balliol, not the tomb tabard, that king of Scotland, who many believe was a puppet of Edward I. No, the, the, the father of the tomb tabard, also John Balliol. But he, he, he said no. So he was a translator of Schopenhauer, for example. Um, so he was out of government in the early 1920s. And then, even though he was very mature, to put it mildly at this stage, he um, crossed the floor. He was, he was, he'd been ennobled. He was Viscount all down by this stage. And he joined the Labour Party. And he served in the cabinet of the first Labour government, um, 1923 to 24. Um, he, he provided there was some much needed ballast. Of course, Labour had never been in government before, so they had nobody with um, ministerial experience, apart from him and a few other Liberals. Was this, a, was this a principle to change? Perhaps it was. Those are more unfair. It's opportunistic. The Liberals have been pushed into being the third party. Uh, the Liberals are still riven by this rivalry between Asquith and Lloyd George, and that was just to dog them for, for decades. And that's why, after 1945, they became a real minnow of political party. So he died ooh, in the late 1920s. He's buried in Scotland. I don't remember where. But um, he um, was also, uh, along with Hobhouse, he was one of the fathers of new liberalism in the early 20th century that believed that liberalism shouldn't just be about laissez-faire, it should sometimes be about intervention. So this might be seen as proto-socialism, as in there should be old age pensions, there should be unemployment benefit, there should be sickness benefit, um, some sort of national insurance scheme. That's something which is now accepted by all but the most right-wing person. Um, so that was a sea change that um, uh, taxes should be based on ability to pay, there should be graduated taxation. So sort of rejection of Gladstonian liberalism, trying to offer something to, to the rising working class. Um, perhaps he, he um, anticipated that the growing strength of the Labour Party posed a possibly mortal peril to, to, to um, the liberals if they didn't offer the working class something. Unbridled capitalism wasn't enough. They had to do something to reduce poverty because uh, unchecked um, uh, capitalism wasn't... Um, ensuring that people had a decent standard of living, but perhaps they sowed the seeds of their own downfall. Anyway, that is Lord Haldane, who's a largely forgotten figure now, but uh, was one of the preeminent political personalities of the first quarter of the 20th century in this country, living here on Queen Anne Street, where so many distinguished political figures lived just across the street, but further down, um, Viscount Grey of Falladoon, uh, the uh, Liberal um, Foreign Secretary of the First World War, Viscount Palmerston, Prime Minister a few doors down, William Smith, an 18th century MP, advocate of, of, of liberal, uh, sorry, of, of, of religious equality, um, the grandfather of, of Florence Nightingale as well, and on and on. That's enough from me. Toodaloo.